Good afternoon. My name is Amy Pittenger. I'm the chair of the Faculty and University Senate Consultative Committees. It's my pleasure to introduce President Eric W. Keeler today before he gives his final State of the University address as our president. President Keeler has been our president since 2011 and has taken on major challenges during his time as the leader of our great university. But I'll highlight two recent examples that really stand out. The first example is the successful partnership agreement that was reached under President Keeler's leadership between Fairview Health Services and the University of Minnesota Physicians. This partnership creates an op new opportunities for clinical research, interprofessional education, and patient care to Minnesotans across the state. Another success that President Keeler will be known for is the President's Initiative to Prevent Sexual Misconduct. This has been a bold and successful initiative that continues to progress in both its development and implementation and is improving the campus climate and advancing a culture at the university by supporting equity, inclusion, and community. I also want to thank President Keeler for his engaged consultation and commitment to shared governance as both a value and a process. We are lucky to have a long history of robust shared governance at the University of Minnesota. It is at the center of why we are such an amazing institution. But this shared governance only exists when our leaders also recognize the advantages of diversity of thought and healthy debate when addressing complex issues. So again, thank you, President Keeler, for your commitment to this shared governance. And now it is my honor to introduce President Eric W. Keeler, the 16th president of the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> the University of Minnesota, founded in the faith that people are ennobled by understanding, dedicated to the advancement of learning and the search for truth, devoted to the instruction of youth and the welfare of the state, the University of Minnesota. That, as some of you will recognize with one editorial update, is the inscription on the front of Northrop Auditorium on the Minneapolis campus. I spoke about that inscription in some detail at my inauguration as president more than seven years ago, and I have found it to be good guidance in the intervening years. I commend it to you. Despite dedication and devotion, <clears throat> as I reflect on all that we have accomplished together since 2011, I know we have had setbacks. In those areas where we've stumbled, there are a few common denominators, and for me, even some regrets. Among those regrets are I wish I had listened more while making decisions. I wish I had taken more unstructured time to talk with people, from my bosses on the Board of Regents, to researchers, to community members, to students on the walkways and in the residence halls, to staff members in their labs, and to faculty in their classroom and their offices. And I wish I had done a better job of demonstrating more often and more loudly how thankful I am for all the work that you do. So I begin my comments today with simply, thank you. And I'm pleased to be with you today. And thanks to all of you watching on your screens of various sizes, including at our campuses in Duluth, Morris, and Rochester. Crookston actually is closed today for a blizzard, but the UMC community members, I'm sure, are busily watching from home. Let me acknowledge some members of the in the audience here today, members of our Board of Regents, our Regents Michael Shu, Darren Rocha, and Abdul Omari was scheduled to be here, and there he is. Welcome to three of my bosses. Uh, Regent Tom Anderson uh, was scheduled to be watching from, uh, from Morris, uh, but was unable to be there, and Regent Dave McMillan is attending online. And I know chancellors are watching on their home campuses, and I'm delighted to be joined by several members of my senior leadership team, including the executive vice president and provost Karen Hansen, who really enabled me to have a terrific partner and colleague through this journey. I also want to acknowledge and thank Tom Swain for being with, here, with us here today, a terrific member of our community and the last living member of the proud class of 1942. I also want to acknowledge and thank Lori Sturdivant uh, for being with us here today and 
as it is my last State of the University address, uh, I will, as you might expect, take a few minutes to reflect on the successes and failures of the past eight years, but then we will spend the bulk of our time together in a conversation between Lori and me about what the future might look like. You know that I am a scientist, a researcher, and an engineer by training. And if you have, as you probably have heard me say, and my lovely wife points out that many people have heard me say this many times, I am a big fan of data, numbers, figures, and more importantly, what they tell us. Since becoming president of the University of Minnesota in 2011, the numbers tell a pretty good story and that would not have been possible without those of you here and those of you working so hard for the University of Minnesota. First and foremost, we have remained affordable for Minnesotans. We flattened the tuition curve for Minnesota resident undergraduates. With tuition for Minnesota resident undergraduates increasing at the lowest rate since the Eisenhower administration, which was about the time I was born, and less than the rate of inflation. Our four-year graduation rate on the Twin City campus has dramatically improved from a 54% four-year graduation rate in 2011 to 71% in 2018. And at least as important and tightly and inextricably linked to those improved graduation rates, we have reduced the amount of debt our students carry upon graduation and increased the fraction of students who graduate debt-free. Very important to realize we did not do this work in a vacuum. A strong partnership with the governor and the legislature was key to that success. And indeed, the state of Minnesota has a lot to say about how affordable the University of Minnesota can be. In research, we are on track to pass the $1 billion threshold in external research funding by next year. That's a big number. Our MinDrive research partnership with the state of Minnesota has generated more than 70 million additional research dollars in areas such as neuroscience, robotics, water quality, and food protection, all tied to key Minnesota industries. The University of Minnesota conducts remarkable research across the state. At the University of Minnesota Duluth, the Natural Resources Research Institute is pioneering research through the Natural Resource Atlas of northeastern Minnesota. This allows users to view, explore, analyze, and share information about forest, water, and mineral resources and infrastructure in the region. And at the University of Minnesota Rochester, our newest campus, 100% of the undergraduates engage in research. In innovation, the numbers tell a good story too. Nearly 300 new agreements have been signed with businesses and industry partners under the Minnesota Men IP program. We've created over 130 startups in the last nine years, some of which have been named amongst the best higher education startups in the country. Our economic impact from this research is phenomenal. A $1.2 billion annual impact from U of M research and $407 million dollars in revenue generated by U of M inventions for Minnesota over the past nine years. And we've also been innovative in our approach to reducing administrative costs with $91 million moved from administration to other priorities. In meeting today's workforce needs, we provide 15,000 new graduates each year, most of whom remain in Minnesota. That includes 80% of all the new physicians in the state, all of the dentists, pharmacists, and veterinarians, almost all of the PhDs in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the U also meets workforce needs through innovative programs, including the University of Minnesota Crookston's new Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture Communication. And the University of Minnesota at Rochester is, since their first graduating class in 2013, helping to meet additional workforce needs in healthcare fields. Like it or not, Athletics serves as the front door or front window on our great university campuses. And here too, we've navigated major challenges. But we've also seen Big Ten championships and rising student athlete GPAs and graduation rate and an abundance of national championships in hockey. The Twin Cities is among the just eight 
public universities that have been named among the best by the prestigious Center for Measuring University Performance, now at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. We are in the top 25 uni public universities nationally in nine distinct categories, from undergraduate qualifications to endowment research dollars. So in Minnesota terms, that's pretty good. So I do believe the state of the University of Minnesota is strong. I'd argue that how a person allocates limited resources, limited time, and limited money is a good indicator of their values. And as president, I've given time and priority to a handful of initiatives. An important one has been developing and then helping to lead our philanthropic campaign called Driven. This is a $4 billion campaign, another big number, to raise money for scholarships, professorships, and research support and new facilities on all of our campuses. We have raised to date $3.3 billion, and we have two more years to go. These funds will provide extensive scholarships for students from low-income families and un underrepresented backgrounds. They will help us to recruit and retain our talented faculty. And these funds will help us to continue to develop and improve our built infrastructure in support of the good work done on all of our campuses by our faculty, staff, and students. This campaign now has over 220,000 contributors. That is 220,000 distinct donors who believe in a profound way in the future of this place. And half of those donors are first-time contributors to the university. I'm very grateful to the University of Minnesota Foundation and devoted volunteer leaders, the campaigns chaired by our good friends John and Nancy Lindahl, for an amazing effort and outcome. A second priority has been the improvement of our relationship with Fairview Health Services and the associated investment in, and in an improvement of our medical school standing and the work in our health science programs more broadly. As a result of hard work and terrific leadership by many, including Dean Jacob Tolar and others for the U, and the team led by Fairview CEO James Herford, a remarkable new agreement and alignment of funding and leadership was achieved in November of last year. This new arrangement will provide both the resources and the landscape for dramatic improvement in teaching, research, and most importantly, patient care for the benefit of all Minnesotans. A third priority has been reaching and supporting talent from underrepresented communities in Minnesota. And here, honestly, while we have made progress, we continue to have a long way to go. Our population of students of color has grown by 46% in the past 10 years, and the number of black undergraduate students has increased to about 1,900 on the Twin Cities campus but the percentage of black students is only 6%. And even in that number, I know we are significantly lacking in attracting and retaining students from historically black communities in Minnesota. Moreover, once talented students of color join the U, we have more work to do to ensure they have an outstanding university experience and are able to graduate and thrive. Part of our continuing work is through the university's community outreach, retention, and engagement program called CORE. It engages students of color as early as the eighth grade to expand a talent pipeline from our communities to our university. The University of Minnesota Rochester has effectively eliminated any achievement gap between minority and white students, which those that exist at nearly all other schools. And I want to be able to say that about the entire U of M system. We also need to make sure that we continue to deliver on our opportunity for and obligation to American Indian students, including through the University of Minnesota Morris's American Indian Tuition Waiver Program. One-fifth of the students at Morris are American Indian, and all attend Morris tuition free. American Indian students at Morris graduate at rates higher than the national average for four-year colleges and their program in American Indian Studies is nationally recognized. As proud as I am of the successes, I also reflect on the challenges we've navigated and the regrets that I have. 
Chief among my regrets are the actions following the death of Dan Markison <clears throat> during a University of Minnesota clinical trial in 2004. While his passing occurred long before I arrived, I regret that I did not recognize the reality of the flaws in our work with human research participants sooner. Eventually, we did get it right, but only with the help of thoughtful voices and the engagement of the University Senate, as well as a dedicated group of outside reviewers. Our Institutional Review Board and the associated work with human participants are now a model for ethical research practices, but getting it right took too long. Finally, our ability to deal with sexual misconduct in our Twin Cities campus community and beyond has been tested. But we have made good progress. We've chosen to examine and act within the framework that sexual misconduct is a public health emergency. With strong leadership from Professor Karen Mitch and Public Health Dean John Finnegan, the President's Initiative to Prevent Sexual Misconduct is working towards real and lasting culture change. To date, more than 300 university academic leaders, including me, have attended workshops aimed at helping us understand our responsibilities, know what resources are available, and feel equipped to carry out our responsibilities related to sexual harassment prevention. 99.2% of our faculty, in other words, nearly everybody, faculty and staff, completed our online training program. 95% of the undergraduate students and 85% of the graduate students have completed a comprehensive online training course. In the end, my actions as president have been consistent with my personal values and the mission of the University of Minnesota. In the end, I believe this university is a better place for students, faculty, and staff than it was in 2011. And in the end, I'm very thankful for all you've done during these exciting years. I'm thankful for our health and safety professionals who work 24 hours a day to keep our campuses safe. I'm thankful for our custodial and maintenance staff and engineers who keep our sidewalks plowed, no mean feat this winter, and our campuses operating, enabling all aspects of our mission. I'm thankful for our students who work hard in pursuit of knowledge, skills, and that all-important degree from a top-tier public research university. I am thankful for the faculty and staff who mentor and guide students towards success in their classes and postgraduate careers. I'm thankful for your partnership to make the University of Minnesota degree as valuable, excellent, and as accessible as possible. And I'm thankful for my wife, Karen, for her, <clears throat> I practice this, her generosity, enthusiasm, and shared commitment to the University of Minnesota. She is here somewhere. She, uh, as you might know, is not a University of Minnesota graduate, but she is the best naturalized gopher you'll ever find. <laughs> Finally, I'm thankful for the life-changing opportunity to serve as your university president these past eight years. It has been the honor of a lifetime. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the rest of the afternoon session. Uh, Lori Sturdivant is a Star Tribune editorial writer and columnist who has written about Minnesota government and politics in 1978. She's also the author of, and editor of 11 books about notable Minnesotans. Ms. Sturdivant is a native of Del Rapids, South Dakota and a graduate of Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She has also been a member of Coe's uh, Board of Regents for 30 years. Ms. Sturdivant lives in St. Paul with her husband, and they have three grown children. Now I welcome Lori Sturdivant to the stage. Thank you for those remarks, President Kaler. Thank you thank, very much. Thank, thank you, you for, for being service. here. Yes, thank you. thank you for your service to this state and to this fine institution. And hi, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Thank you to all of you for being here today, for caring about this institution, and thank you to, to those who are tuning in from around the state. 
Uh, we're going to be working today, President Kaler, with questions that have been submitted in advance, a few that I thought up myself, and then uh, we're going to invite this audience and those who are listening and watching in remote locations to participate as well. It's not too late to submit a question. There will be staffers in the aisles with cards that uh, will be collected at some point. Just keep an eye out for those staffers and we, they will magically sort the cards into topical areas and, and bring those questions to the fore before our program ends this afternoon. We also have an opportunity for people to submit questions online, and the hashtag to use is hashtag capital U-M-N, lowercase S-O-T-U, which stands for State of the University. It does. All right. So we have a lot of ground to cover, and I know you are a crisp answerer of questions. So I we'll will do my best. We will proceed. I will, I'll start with a, a sort of a nice big softball for you. I, I, I know that what attracted you to this university as a student years ago and what attracted you as a, as a, a president much later, what, what may keep you here longer still is your uh, acknowledgement that this university plays a significant role as a problem solver in this state. And we're gonna talk about a lot of the state's future problems in this conversation. Things like climate change and water quality and keeping this planet fed and, and curing some of the scourges and diseases that have plagued us for so long. We'll talk about many of those things in turn, but talk about this university's capacity as a problem solver and the challenges it faces in that role going forward in the next decade or two? Well, great research universities like the University of Minnesota should do exactly that. We solve problems. We invent tomorrow. We educate the, the people who will figure out how to invent the day after tomorrow. And that's really what we do. Okay. And so part of our land grant mission, part of our, our responsibility as a public institution uh, is to be available to the people of the state of Minnesota and responsive to their their needs, and there's a long list of, of things that, that we do and, or have done uh, that, that, that drive that, whether it's the, the spin-off companies that create uh, new jobs, whether it's our ability to respond to uh, invasive species, uh, whether it's our vet diagnostics laboratories work in, in the avian flu uh, incident of a few years ago, whether it's the breathtaking and groundbreaking work that our medical researchers are, are doing. We are treating diseases, we are inventing and developing everything from video technology to unbelievably effective pharmaceuticals. So that is what we do, and I really do think it is in the DNA uh, of the institution. That is, that is what we're about. And it, it permeates the entire state. We have research and outreach centers. We have affiliation agreements with medical institutions. We have uh, great campuses uh, across the state with, with great research uh, institutes. I mentioned NRRI in, uh, in Duluth as, a, as another example of really stunningly cre creative people applying ideas to problems that are going to improve the quality of life of everybody who lives in Minnesota. And what would you say are the, some of the biggest impediments right now that are holding the university back as a problem solver? Would it be funding? Would it be talent? Would it be something else, facilities, which are related to both funding and talent? What would you say it would be? Well, I think it's a little bit of, of all of the above. Uh, everybody could always use more money to do the next best thing. Uh, I think our ability actually to, to sharpen um, the, the, the knife, if you will, and go after problems with high value and high return is, is actually pretty good. The MinDrive initiative that I mentioned uh, was very strategically, the topics within it are very strategically chosen uh, to align with, with needs and opportunities, but also places where we thought we could get quick wins, where we could, the, the return versus time curve was gonna be the steepest. Uh, you know, medical devices are, 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 is a great example. Uh, the idea of, of neurostimulation, pacemaker for your brain, uh, is real. And we're putting those, mm -hmm. we being not me, people who know how to are putting them in, in people and, and making life-changing improvements. Mm -hmm. So um, those, those dollars we've gotten strategically and our, our faculty are, are very prolific at going out and getting, getting more money from, from other people. So oddly enough, that might not be the, the biggest uh, impediment. I think our ability to, to translate research and move it into the marketplace is also better than, than average. I mentioned the, the intellectual property men IP agreements we have, which lower the barrier for, for that kind of, uh, of collaboration. I think at the end of the day, uh, as we look to the future, the thing that worries me most is uh, talent. Where are we going to get the people that can execute on all of those, those elements? And, 
an educated population is critical to the United States, and it's, it's even more so to, to, uh, to a state like Minnesota where people don't move because of the weather or the taxes. They well, move here for talent. Well, and that's a concern not of this, just of, of this university, but of many of the institutions, many of the employers in the state are concerned about talent and, and how Minnesota is going to cope with a demographic trough we're experiencing. The growth in the, in the working age population in the state is about to come to a screeching halt. It occurs to me that there are sort of two sides to that question. There's a, a, a numbers, of numbers of, of, of bodies question, the talent. And then there's a, a productivity question, getting the most of the people that we already have. And the university kind of plays on both sides of that, doesn't it? Well, we, we certainly think we do. We think we are a magnet for talented people to come uh, to Minnesota to pursue an education. Uh, and frankly, if they're coming to, to come to work in Minnesota, we're a really important part of the, the cultural infrastructure uh, that makes uh, Minnesota a great place to live. Uh, the Twin Cities uh, exist in no small part because the University of Minnesota has created the opportunities there. Uh, we're, we're a heartbeat in Morris and, and Crookston, an important part of the Duluth economy. The newest campus in Rochester, a key element of providing the healthcare workforce that that, that industry needs in, in that part of the uh, the state. So uh, we do think we're attracting and providing that, uh, uh, that workforce. Uh, the other side of this coin, though, very quickly becomes um, something else that I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, which is diversity. We can't expect to fill the workforce needs uh, with white men or white people. So we've got to employ everything we can do to lower the barriers for the partition of per participation of everybody, no, what, no matter what their, their background or their nationality, their ethnicity, come, get smart, and get to work. Well, and that is clearly something you mentioned in your remarks <coughs> earlier, how the, the, on your watch diversity has improved, but with certain populations, it's still a struggle. It's a struggle for the entire state as well, and I wonder what you see as the university's role in making other Minnesotans realize the opportunity and the potential that exists with fully employing the human capital we already have. Well, and I think part of the, the, the answer is actually in, in the question, which is the employing the human capital we already have. We have to be able to employ that human capital at its highest and best level. So we need to be educating people and creating jobs uh, that are intellectually demanding, that are sophisticated, that pay well, and that create the, the, the spin-offs for, for attracting uh, other people. And so coming to the University of Minnesota, getting a top flight degree from a top flight program tees you up for success in the rest of your life. And our job is to create as much of that opportunity as we can. I have to push back on you a little bit on the, the point you made about talent magnet, because I know there's been a controversy, a debate in, on this campus and with the Board of Regents about tuition policy for non-resident, non-reciprocity students. Uh, is Minnesota doing all it can to be a magnet for students from other states? Well, that's... Um, a topic you and I have, have chatted about any, any number of times. And uh, like most things in life, it's an attempt to get the balance right. We did have uh, amongst the lowest, if not the lowest, uh, the jargon is NRNR, non-resident, non-reciprocity, so you're not from Wisconsin or the Dakotas, students. We had the lowest price, uh, tuition price, or second lowest tuition price for those students for a long time. And that was done on purpose. That was, was cut um, 12 or 13 years ago uh, with the idea that we would grow the supply of students. Uh, and that worked. We got in a larger number of, of NR and our students. So we, that, that, that's your talent magnet function. Then you get a, a, a conversation that says, what are we doing with respect to fairness of price for Minnesota residents? Are we actually subsidizing in our, in our students with state dollars? Uh, would we be as competitive if our price point was nearer to the mid-range uh, of, of the Big Ten? What does what you charge for a degree say about the value perceived or not in the marketplace of that degree? So that's been a robust discussion amongst the regents and, and me uh, for several years. And so being an engineer, let's do an experiment. 
And so what we have been doing for the past now three years is increasing the NRNR rate uh, at, a, at a 10 to 12 percent um, clip for new students. If you've come already as an NRNR student, your tuition uh, has gone up five and a half percent a year, mm -hmm. still greater than resident tuition, but not uh, as high as, as new students. Um, and last year, we saw a dip in the number of NRNR students come. And the economics is that if you raise the price, you'd like to get fewer buyers. But there are many levers to do this. It's becoming a long answer. But there's levers to doing this. So we were employing additional recruiters in hot spots for us, Northern California and Texas. We're seeing an increase in, in students coming from those places. The other player on the field here, and then I'll, then I'll shut up, um, is uh, resident tuition at the University of Illinois in uh, Champaign-Urbana. The chancellor there uh, now is our good friend Robert Jones, known to, to many here. Um, and Robert's a talented and, and very smart guy. And so he and other higher education leaders in Illinois said, we've got to stop this, this brain drain of young people from, from Illinois. So it used to be the case that our NRNR, resident, NRNR tuition was lower than an Illinois resident would pay to go to the University of Illinois. Think about that for a minute. So here we come, mm -hmm. particularly from the Chicagoland area. Our NRNR tuition is now higher than the resident tuition in Illinois, and that flow has slowed for reasons other things Illinois is doing as well. So there are a lot of moving pieces in this, Lori. It's not, it's not a black or white Kind of kind of thing, and we are we are exploring. Sounds those like letters. it's something that it really requires fairly constant monitoring. It, we um, our admissions folks uh, every day. Yes, uh, and, and demographic every trends day. play into this yeah. as the number of high school graduates in the Midwest. I know in some states it's already declining. I believe in Minnesota it won't decline until after we get into the 2020s. But still, there is a, a decline coming in high school graduates. What kind of a challenge will that pose? To well, the that, again, that again um, also plays off the fact that, that uh, the last data I saw about overall population growth in Minnesota, 100% of that growth will come from people, people of color. color. Mm -hmm. So again, we've got to be as aggressively and as proactively as we can in communities of color saying, the, you're, you're a smart young person. You need to have the University of Minnesota as part of your future. You need to think about coming to the U. And that's work to be done, because in many communities, we're perceived as being too elitist. We're perceived as being too white. We're perceived as being unwelcoming. All of the things that, that don't make us the first choice. So we've got to make communities aware of what people in the communities aware of what is here. And then we need to walk the walk. We need to be more open. We need to be more uh, welcoming. We need to do the things that promote a, a, a frank and, and healthy and wholesome exchange of views and, and, and points of, of living across all populations. And well, we're not there yet. And then let me ask about another component of this attract, being a talent magnet and attracting people, the international students. University of Minnesota for years had a strong reputation, going way back to the 1930s, of attracting students from China in big numbers, for example. Uh, all of that international study is, is somewhat challenged right now, not just for this institution, but for many American institutions because of federal policy. Mm -hmm. What would you say about that situation? Are we experiencing a temporary pause or blip here, or are we experiencing a longer-lasting challenge, would well, you say? Well, I, I, think, I think we have to wait and see. I think it is true that the numbers of students uh, from China uh, are down. The number of students from Vietnam are up. Mm -hmm. So last year we did have a, a dip in international students, undergraduates we're talking about here now. Um, you know, will that come back? Will it become diversified, if you will, because, because of, uh, of opportunities for, uh, for the other uh, BRIC nations outside of China? Uh, we can be a more international uh, campus, not just a Chinese-American campus, and that would actually be good. Uh, but I can't predict for you what um, the United States foreign policy and immigration policy will do in terms of, of increasing barriers um, for international students to come. 
um, or increasing barriers for them to stay once they come and get educated in this country. I'm a firm believer that if somebody gets a, a PhD um, at an American university, we should staple a green card to it and say, welcome mm -hmm. to your new home. We've just educated this person. Why in the world does it make any sense to make them go back to where they came from? Are higher education institutions saying enough, being vocal enough it, with regard to national policy on these questions? Well, we're trying hard, actually. Uh, the president of the American Association, uh, Association of American Universities, uh, Mary Sue Coleman, former president at Michigan, uh, Peter McPherson at APLU, um, they're in Congress, they're testifying, they're, they're telling the story um, as aggressively, I think, as, as we know how. But there's a lot of a lot of mouths to feed and people competing for attention, and, and I won't say anything more about our Washington scene, but it's, it's oh. a challenge right now. <laughs> okay. We can't leave the diversity topic without talking about the current issue on campus, the naming of buildings. And I, I'd like to uh, invite you to, to talk about this task force recommendation to change the names of four buildings. You've endorsed those changes, why have you done so, and what's next in that realm? Well, we uh, had a really long process, uh, which we, of course, were criticized for, but it was very thoughtful and very scholarly uh, that led to the appointment of a, of a task force of, uh, uh, of historians, as well as an undergraduate student and a, and a graduate student to tell us a little bit about being in those buildings. Uh, they did a deep dive uh, in the archives, came forward uh, with um, both pros and cons of naming or, or, or unnaming, leaving the name or, or moving the name. Um, I evaluated those, and you know there are four buildings, so there are four different reasons and probably four different places on the spectrum. Um, but my view is that the, the call, while perhaps close on, on one, um, was enough to, to propose um, taking those names uh, off. Uh, but it's a, it's a long and deliberative process, and the ultimate uh, decision rests uh, at, the, at the Board of Regents. So we brought those uh, forward. Uh, the Regents had a chance to, to discuss them. Um, it was frustrating because the time scale that we had in place um, for the conversation was nowhere near long enough to, to accomplish the, the conversation, and that's my fault as much as anybody's. Um, that a robust discussion. I think it was, was clear uh, that the sentiment among um, a, a strong majority of the, of the regions was at that point in time either to get some more information uh, or to not proceed with renaming at all. They are the ultimate uh, decision makers in this. Uh, the committee also proposed a, a variety of other uh, steps forward that would, uh, in a short way, simply tell the history of the individual uh, in a more comprehensive and, and, uh, and nuanced way, both the pros of, of what the person did uh, and, and the cons. These four men are, by definition, uh, historical figures at the University of, of Minnesota. Uh, they did some, some significantly good and important things. Looking again at, at the history, it suggests that they also were part of things that, that weren't so good. And so we, we make, uh, at the end of the day, uh, a decision. It's a judgment decision uh, about how to proceed. This whole episode brought to my mind a, a larger conversation in the academy, in higher education, about shared governance, about who decides. And clearly, you mm -hmm. just said, in this matter, the Board of Regents decides. And that, I think, it is clear. But it decides with a collaborative process that's part of the tradition of higher education. Talk a little bit about shared governance at the University of Minnesota. It's something that has, uh, has, is time honored. Is it, as fit, is it fit for the 21st century? Um, I, I smile. It is, uh, mm -hmm. it is, I think, common for uh, newly arrived administrators at the University of Minnesota to marvel mm -hmm. at the, the depth and breadth of shared governance and, and the engagement <laughs> Uh, of significant numbers of, of busy faculty members mm -hmm. in those, those conversations. And I think it's terrific. I, I had an issue just today that I talked to the faculty consultative uh, committee about and you know, get the, the faculty point of view. Uh, staff are also engaged in, in governance in, in various ways. And it really lets you get a sense for the pulse uh, of the institution. Um, you know, I mentioned in my remarks the, the issues around human participants. Um, 
I inherited a situation there that actually needed to be looked at. And faculty governance was very helpful in helping me frame and organize how to, how to go about, about doing that. So uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a treasure uh, for the mm -hmm. institution and, uh, uh, and a distinguishing feature that I, that I think should continue to be uh, cultivated. Well, very good. Well, I, I come to you, as you know, from a long stint in the Capitol basement. <laughs> having retired it's nicer just, now. Yeah, having yeah. just retired in December. I'm not as down there as much, but I'm well aware that there is another public higher education in system in this state, and that of late, it has seemed to have a higher claim on legislators' devotion than the University of Minnesota has had. How would you describe the relationship that exists between the University of Minnesota and what the system now called Minnesota State? And how has that relationship evolved? Is it collaboration? Is it competition? Is it both? Well, it, it's by, by its nature to have to be both because uh, we are in many cases competing for, uh, for the same Minnesota student to come to, to one of the U campuses or, uh, or a Minnesota State campus, and that's healthy. I mean, one of the, again, great treasures of the state of Minnesota is an incredibly diverse and robust higher education mm -hmm. system. I mean, if, if, if you haven't found the school as a, as a high school senior uh, that's just right for you in the state of Minnesota, you haven't looked hard enough because we have something for everybody. Very strong private schools, mm -hmm. Minsk U and, and the U. Uh, we have a good uh, articulation agreement. Many of our students begin at a Minnesota State school and then transfer to the U. We have the largest transfer uh, cohort most years of any uh, Big Ten uh, institution, the Twin Cities campus, will attract more transfer students. Um, that's that's good and healthy, so that people have opportunities in in both place and and nature of what they they study. That's all that's all good. Um, we do compete for for state resources, um, but we're really trying hard um, to improve what I would say the mission differentiation, the 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 ability to say, okay, these things are alike, but also how are they different? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to be able to tell that story uh, to the legislature and to our new governor in a, in a crisp and clear way is, is important. The research mission at this university is sacred. It is, it is so critical to the future of this state and its people that that needs investment. Minnesota State, of course, has a broad geographic uh, distribution in Minnesota, but so do we. And we sometimes don't let that story be told as clearly as it, as it could be. You know, a research and outreach uh, center is playing a vital role in, uh, in the community that, that's, that that is in. Um, so that's, that's the, well, is, the effort we try to make. Is that the reason, would you say, that the university hasn't been getting as much love at the legislature as you maybe would like to have seen in the last few years? Is it that the policymakers don't fully appreciate the needs and the demands of this research mission and the opportunities it presents? I think that's part of it. And I think, um, frankly, there are a lot of, of uh, issues in Minnesota that, that tee up on the, the rural uh, versus metro uh, divide. Everything from from presidential elections to to transportation. So, in Greater Minnesota, the many campuses of Minnesota State, I think, have an easier job of of having their local representatives and senators feel good uh, about them and supportive of the system as a whole. We, despite the distributions that I've described a couple of times, are viewed as a more metrocentric. Um, organization because of the size of the Twin Cities campuses. Uh, and so that might not be as, as, as well supported uh, amongst legislators from around the state as, as their local uh, Minnesota State uh, campus. And that's, that's incumbent on us to tell the story about, you know, you're right, it is metrocentric, but the veterinarian office that is serving your constituents is staffed by University of Minnesota graduates. And you would call on this audience and others to begin to, to step up those arguments? Would that make a difference? I call on every audience I meet every day <laughs> to step up that, <laughs> that story. Let me begin to talk about a few other problems that the state faces, and probably none is bigger for the state and our planet than climate change right now. This was one of the submitted questions that I really admired it. How do we, all of us, everywhere, but especially those who lead a major research university, 
make the significant changes that are needed to avoid the very worst of the catastrophic climate change that is upon us. How big a deal is climate change research at this institution and what's its role in helping Americans, helping Minnesotans and other Americans understand what this planet is facing? So, so we really have two sides to that, maybe three sides to that. Uh, one is, is the scientific research uh, and engineering itself that provides uh, a fix or a cure for um, global warming, climate change. So into that bucket falls uh, much research on uh, renewable energy. Much research like is, is done at, at the University of Minnesota at Morris on uh, creating uh, ammonia using solar energy and, uh, and very clever chemical engineering. Um, those kind of technological scientific advances get to be, get to be made. Then there's the policy issue. How do you address um, policy questions around energy use, energy pricing? Um, Regent McMillan is, is, I hope, still listening because he's mm -hmm. going to be proud that I mentioned electric power, uh, a key element in, in northeastern Minnesota's economy. If we're going to, to uh, generate uh, iron or non-ferrous metals in northern Minnesota, that's a huge electrical consumption. How do we do that in a sustainable way with either wind, water, or, or solar? So the policy questions around that are really teed up beautifully in uh, the Humphrey School. We have um, a top 10, uh, eighth rated uh, public policy institute in the country. This is where smart people can come together. And again, you hope to be able to attract people from both sides of the issue who come and debate in a, in a respectful and, and productive kind of way and not just yell at one another. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, that policy issue gets, gets there. And then there's the issue about what we as an institution uh, can do. Uh, and we're doing a lot. We really are, are focusing on reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, we made a $100 million investment in a, in a steam power plant, uh, natural gas power that's uh, incredibly uh, efficient. It's essentially a very large jet engine inside a building with all of the drama associated with having that run. Um, it's really moving uh, far down the carbon chain to, to towards uh, natural gas or, or solar or renewable, uh, other renewables as we can. So I think we're active in all three spaces that, that uh, matter there. And again, being able to, to maintain our standard of life, uh, standard of living, while reducing the impact on the planet is something that, that most of our students are very excited about being part of doing. When I thought reflected on this question, I thought about the outreach mission of the university, which is part of that three-legged stool mm -hmm. we sometimes talk about, education, research, and outreach. Is the, the climate change imperative now such that the university might consider ramping up its outreach in this, uh, on these matters in a practical way for Minnesotans and also in a, in a policy way? Well, I think that some of that policy outreach is, is going on, I think, as, as it's woven into the, the, the programming that, that we bring uh, to, you know, whether it's from 4-H to, uh, to science shows that we bring uh, grade school kids to see at the U that, that, that that's there. Um, one of the wonderful things about being a university president um, is, is the observation that it's a, it's a, lot, it's a lot like standing on, like, on top of a graveyard. There are a lot of people underneath you, but nobody's listening. So it's a- <laughs> Not a lot of internal support, right? <laughs> right. So, so the metaphor is uh, we support faculty driving the intellectually curious things that drive them. And we have a broad range of them who are interested in, in the subjects uh, that I mentioned. Uh, should the next president have an opportunity if, if she wants to make a climate change initiative uh, a part of, part of her legacy, she could do that and she could probably get people to help her. Yeah. I wanted to invite you to talk a little bit more about medicine. You spoke well about the, the, the advancement that with, uh, with Fairview creating M Health Fairview and, and the new relationship that will be, I think, very beneficial for the university at all on your watch. But we know there's nothing that's static in the world of medicine and American healthcare, and that there is another competitor, a major healthcare institution in this state, the Mayo Clinic, that seems to be encroaching ever more closely into the Twin Cities market. 
I wonder uh, what's next in your view for academic medicine and, and uh, uh, the kind of medicine that's practiced at the University of Minnesota Hospitals and what's next in this region and what should the university be doing to prepare for that? So uh, first, the first what next is to really finish what, we're, what we are now, are now in the early stages of, which is a new relationship uh, with Fairview. And, and again, a relatively new uh, dean in the medical school, Jacob Tolar, um, has a vision for how this system integrated with, uh, with medical, with faculty, medical faculty and Fairview uh, really can deliver on the, on the promise. And the secret is a, is a dyad leadership, to have a, a Fairview uh, person and a university person in co-leadership roles in the service lines that, that, that treat our patients, uh, in, in how we control quality, how we, how we um, manage patient safety, uh, et cetera. And so putting that structure together and, and peopling it uh, is, is really um, significantly uh, important. Uh, we think that'll bring great, great benefits. Uh, Senior Vice President Brian Burnett was a key part of the negotiating team. Uh, he's also our CFO, so we are doing this in a, in a way that sharply helps us optimize the resources that, that this space can, can bring to us. But at the end of the day, there really are two things that, that matter. One is patient outcomes. No doctor is going to refer his or her patient to a system for additional care that doesn't have high quality, reproducible, and repeatable patient outcomes. So we've got to drive that quality lever as, as strongly as we possibly can. And the other thing is scale. So as we now are providing what we envision will be a higher quality product uh, to our, our patient base, we also have the opportunity to grow that patient base and grow uh, what, what, what we're seeing. You see this uh, the consolidations and acquisitions uh, across the, um, the country. Uh, so I'm, I don't think I'm telegraphing a top secret business model, but you'll see those two things, uh, I think, help us move uh, dramatically uh, in, in rankings and in patient satisfaction and outcomes. How would you describe this institution's relationship with the Mayo Clinic, which I know goes way back in history? Yeah, that one is, um, again, not unlike Minnesota State. Uh, we obviously compete for, for patients and, and procedures. That's normal. Uh, but we also collaborate. We have a very strong program uh, in, uh, with, with funding from the state of Minnesota uh, in diabetes. Uh, we have uh, referrals back and forth and in some areas of, of specialty uh, medicine, uh, you, you would choose to go to the Mayo instead of here. And in others, you should choose to come here instead of go to Mayo. Uh, and that's, again, a great, I'm trying to avoid saying healthy outcome um, <laughs> for uh, the people of, of Minnesota. But uh, there's a, a great deal of respect and, uh, and communication between uh, the, the Mayo leadership and, and the university at all levels. That's good to know. Let me switch gears again and talk about something that I know is dear to some of the people in this audience, and that's athletics. You mentioned it in your, in your early opening remarks. Clearly, on your watch, facilities are better, and you mentioned the GPAs and graduation rates are up. We've had some programmatic success, uh, proud of some of those, especially those women's teams. But uh, there's a, a, a sense that unless those, some of those big men's sports are doing very, very well, something's not quite right. At least some of your fans, the university's gopher fans, would, would say it as much. What should be the measure of a successful athletic program at a research university in a metropolitan area such as this one? So to me, um, you really have to start and end with the student athlete. I mean, are the student athletes coming to the university, having a high quality experience on and off the field? Are they developing as, as athletes, recognizing that 99% of them uh, will not play professionally uh, in their, their sport? Uh, and are they growing as human beings? Are, are they emerging as, as well-rounded young people uh, with a great college education and, 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 and who have had uh, the terrific opportunity to play their sport at the highest level. That's the measure. Now, around that also have to be some really pretty important things, um, first and foremost of which is, is integrity. Uh, it, the, the frequency at which you can pick up a newspaper and read a heartbreaking or infuriating story about some misconduct in, in the athletic space, um, most recently the admission scandals at... Uh, at certain institutions, um, 
there's no place for that. People cannot step off the path uh, and, and begin to, to, to deviate from the highest ethical uh, standards that, that we should hold ourselves to. Um, we fortunately have uh, an athletic director now in Mark Coyle who is uh, uh, spectacular and uh, is holding his, his folks uh, to very high levels. You see the GPA uh, improvements of our, our student athletes. Uh, I think as we are moving uh, forward, as our, our men's basketball coach is, is growing as a, as a coach, um, with hopefully an NCAA bid uh, this year, and our football coach uh, transforming uh, the team, both in terms of with their performance on the field, but their culture off of it. I'm very optimistic about where uh, Gopher Athletics is, is going to go, and I'm optimistic about the athletic programs uh, on all of our campuses. Well, good. I know you've been a big booster of those programs. I do. I yes, do like you're them. a fan. Okay. A number of questions have come to us about the greater Minnesota campuses. Uh, one in particular noted that there's been a perception on some of those campuses that there's an inequity of the distribution of funds, that too much of the money is staying on the Twin Cities campus. What would you say about that? And what's your vision for those campuses going forward? Sure. So all of the campuses in our system are important to delivery of our mission. So that's, that's the place to start. They're each providing an experience for their students uh, that their students treasure and that is equipping those students for, for success. Um, on the question of, of resources, um, the flip answer, which I don't mean to be as flip as it, as it sounds, is there's not enough money. Mm -hmm. So while system campuses may be feeling that they don't have enough resource, I cannot find a college or budget responsible unit leader on this campus who thinks that they don't have or that they have too much money or they have enough. So the pressures and the allocations are, are, are real. Um, we have a highly transparent budget process. There is no simple formula. Um, we very diligently evaluate the needs and wants of, of the budget units. And there are 51 different budget units at the university. Um, and we line up, those up against the, the available resources. Some units are able to generate revenue from tuition streams. Others can't. Some programs are highly expensive. It costs a lot more to get an MD degree than it does to get a geography degree. So different cost structures, different space structures. The Twin Cities campus has 23 million square feet. It's 10 times bigger, for example, than the Duluth campus. So we have different needs, different, different opportunities for revenue. We lay those up and we incrementally uh, move resources to try to balance so that we're using every dollar to its highest and best good. Mm -hmm. And that does create situations in which people feel they're not, they're not getting enough. And in areas that are, are critically uh, in, in, uh, in need, uh, we provide those critical dollars and that means that they might not be available to go somewhere else. 25 years ago or more now, I guess it is, oh, this university did close a campus in greater Minnesota. And there have been occasionally, not lately, talk about closing of campuses. Has, has that uh, conversation ended? Is, is that something that's no longer on the table, or is that still a, a risk? Well, I think the, the healthy conversation uh, to have uh, would be across the state of Minnesota, uh, both Minnesota State and the U, to evaluate what is the density of educational uh, delivery across the state and how does that match the density of population, uh, the desire to deliver on, a, on um, agricultural research and greater, for the benefit of greater Minnesota, et cetera. So I think a, an overarching statewide conversation uh, would be a logical next step, but I don't know of anybody who's convened that. Mm, I don't either. Several questions about the student experience on all of the campuses. Uh, concern about uh, how to make the student experience, at the, especially I think at the undergraduate level, a wholesome one at a time when uh, concern about mental health distress among students is rising not only on this campus but around the country. How, how can we support students who are dealing with mental health issues and how do we, can we keep the campus environment a wholesome one for all students? Well, student mental health is, um, the, you know, the word crisis is overused, but it, it's an urgent problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, a growing fraction of our undergraduate population 
come to the university with a diagnosis or previous treatment for a mental health um, uh, issue uh, or condition. So this then creates a, a, a burden um, for our university system that was designed for a smaller population of students who need, uh, who need help. And I don't think it's sustainable for people to look to the university to be able to provide that mental health support uh, at, to the, at the breadth and depth that's, that's needed. I think the universities need to provide mental health professionals that can help in crisis, uh, that can help in, in cultivating healthy, wholesome, that's a great mm -hmm, old-fashioned mm -hmm, word these mm -hmm, days, mm -hmm. uh, living styles, uh, making sure people are taking care of themselves, do that. But if you have a, a condition that needs either regular therapy uh, or medication, we need to find a way to look to, to private health insurers and other health care providers to help students, students get that. The other, I'll just finish quickly, the other element ar around that is the overall student experience. Uh, that ranges from the, the quality of the RA in, in your, your residence hall, the ability to, to have recreation centers where people can, can, can work out, the ability to have a food service that's both timely, healthy, and affordable. All of those pieces come together, and, and we're well aware of, of the need to, to be attentive to those. I think a lot of things we do uh, pretty well. Uh, some things, particularly in the mental health space, I think we do, we do well, but the growing demand and the need to, to innovate in that space is, is always there. Well, some of the stress that students experience and complain about is financial stress. Right. So let's talk a little bit about tuition. I know you've worked hard to keep tuition levels from at least to slow that trajectory which had been so rapid in the decade before you arrived. And that was in large measure because of cutbacks at the state legislative mm -hmm. support level. Uh, tuition is still uncomfortably high for many students and student debt is lower through the University of Minnesota Twin Cities than in many other Minnesota colleges or universities, but it's still with, with graduates, the, the debt, average debt load is more than $26,000, which is an uncomfortable amount for many students. Is that an acceptable thing? And if not, what are the prospects for some additional relief or some change in the higher education climate that would make uh, some relief possible? Well, I think there, there really, um, unfortunately, are not a lot of, of creative answers uh, to, to that question because we really do have three principal revenue streams for, for the university, state support, tuition, and philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And so our strategy has been to I work closely with the state uh, to, to enable that uh, revenue stream to grow um, uh, at a rate that enables us to minimize tuition, and we've been pretty successful at that. And then, as I mentioned, philanthropy, we're $3.3 billion into, a, into the driven uh, campaign, and a lot of those dollars will go uh, into scholarship help for not only low-income students, if you're family income is $50,000 uh, or less between the state grant program, Pell Grant, and university financial aid, your tuition's covered. So free tuition, free education uh, is there for, for uh, low-income families. If you're a well-to-do family and you're deciding between uh, going to a private school or coming to the university, the difference in those tuition costs lets you buy a new car every year, so God bless you. Mm -hmm. The problem pinch point is really um, the core middle class, um, upper middle class families, uh, 120, 100 something thousand dollars a year income, trying to put two kids through school. That's a squeeze, and we need to find ways in financial aid to, uh, to make that, that better. Um, you know, we continue to work at cutting costs, um, but a lot of what those costs support are valuable things for the student experience. So the quality cost metric there is another balance point that we have to, have to get to. Let me ask a real specific question about the student experience that came to us from a couple of submitted questions. When will we have enough buses to appropriately accommodate the number of students? especially when the weather does not really permit long walks or long waits right. for a bus. What's the bus story? So my, my secondary job at the University of Minnesota is that I'm the chair of the complaint committee. So, I, <laughs> so you're familiar with I'm this. I'm familiar with this one. And this one, this one is, is certainly compounded uh, by 
uh, by this year's winter. Mm -hmm. uh, both the fact that, that it's cold and miserable uh, and it's difficult to keep the roads clean so the buses can't move through their routes mm -hmm. as quickly, they get backed up. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. I know our, the head of our transportation uh, and, and parking services uh, had a, a, a MSA town hall recently on this. Uh, we're using all the buses uh, that we have. We're trying to deploy the drivers as aggressively as we can within the boundaries of, of safe operation, uh, of course. Um, but I, it, is a, it is a challenge this year, and I uh, uh, recognize what some, one student characterized to me as a Darwinian uh, exercise to, to get a seat on the bus or, or, um, or miss class. So um, short of buy more buses, and we will certainly will look into that. Buses are expensive, back to your previous question. Um, we'll continue to work on it, but it's hard to see a, a sharp, straight, great answer. That'll, that'll happen tomorrow. Spring weather will help. Spring will help. Yes. In lots of ways. Well, let's, let's conclude by talking a little bit about the difficult higher education climate under which you have served and which I don't think is going to get much better, and at least not in the near term, in the wake of this week's news which you mentioned about a major admissions cheating scandal at some of this nation's most prestigious schools. Uh, describe the kind of the higher education climate as you see it, uh, the kind both at the state and national level that you've been dealing with, and the one that Joan Gable will confront. What are the key strategies that you would recommend for this university as it navigates this much more challenging climate? Well, I think the the higher education climate uh, is a microcosm of the political climate uh, in our country right now, and there's a, a real challenge for us to tell our story of added value and great outcomes for, um, for students after they graduate from the university. Um, that is, a, is against the backdrop of increasing distrust of large institutions, uh, distrust of, of legislative uh, activities um, that, that is hard. And so I think our ability to translate this sort of ethereal higher education idea into concrete things that say, here's the experience my young person had, and they've got a great job at, at Target, and they had a great experience at, at the university, and we need to ensure that her younger sister gets that same experience. Personalizing and telling that story, I think, is, is really important in getting out from under the the, the horror stories of the, the $300,000 in debt barista mm -hmm. that we've all heard about many yeah. times. I can affirm the power of storytelling. And so I can. would encourage all of us who care about this institution to do more of it. Thank you very much. Thank President you for taking Kennedy. time to be with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very good.